As I look back on that season, I think it was a defining period of my life. Hi, everybody. This is the championship game of the NCAA College Division Basketball Finals. I had no idea that no other historically black institution had ever won a NCAA title of any kind. I was just playing. At guard number 10, Earl Monroe, and get this, a 6'4 senior from Philadelphia, averaging 42.2 a game. I've won an NBA championship, but I didn't win it. than it is in pro sports. Earl Monroe, oh, long. They can't stop him. I'm just so happy that I've had the opportunity to have a coach like Coach Gaines and to be around those guys that I played with, you know, for those years because it's made me a better person. Gets him in the air, goes back up. To win. You know, over the years, generally, the things that were good, I kept. And the things that were, weren't good, I discarded. I've kept these guys, you know, in my heart all this time. The Rams from Winston-Salem College win it 77 to 74. It begins here. Fields of green, growing tobacco, stretching from the Piedmont through the coastal plain. North Carolina's Tobacco Road runs 100 miles through the heart of the state from Raleigh to Winston-Salem. Along this road lie four of the greatest college basketball programs in the country, NC State, UNC, Duke, and Wake Forest. But in 1967, it was another school along this path that was making headlines, a historically black college with a legendary coach and an exceptional player who, when brought together by fate, made history. Even today, over a half century later, the accomplishments of Coach Clarence Gaines and his star player, Earl the Pearl Monroe, are a source of pride to Winston-Salem State. The first historically black college to win an NCAA national championship in any sport. I can tell you, being chancellor here at this university, it's hard for me to walk around the city without someone asking me about the 1967 uh, men's basketball team. Uh, it has become uh, almost mythical uh, in terms of how people remember it. It really began to shine a light on historically black colleges and universities. HBCUs exist because we were not allowed to go to other universities. We were not accepted at other universities. And as a result of that, those opportunities weren't in the forefront. If black athletes were going to play ball you know, at, at, at an HBCU, in football, it was the Southwestern Athletic Conference. In basketball, it was the CIAA. Originally known as Winston-Salem Teachers College, the unlikely title journey of this tiny Division II school began back in 1945 with the hiring of Clarence Big House Gaines. My father graduated from Morgan State. And then he pursued higher education in the state of New York at Columbia Teachers College. And an interesting fact about that is that that was paid for by the state of North Carolina because there was no state institutions with master degree programs that would allow blacks to get that degree. So the state found a way to pay for people like my dad to go there. Big House was an imposing presence at six feet three inches tall and weighing over 260 pounds. The story goes he pulled up on the campus of Morgan State and when he got out of the car, one of the coaches said, oh my God, he is as big as a house. And that name stuck with him. Some of his players might have spoken under his breath as called him Big Nasty. So he's a tough coach. He's a taskmaster. He told us one night we were going to run until he got tired. Now, how's he going to get tired sitting on a pillow on a, on a bench? But he was serious about it. It was a family in some ways, but they, they knew that Big House was being tough on him because he wanted him to be a winner. 
What made him a great coach was he could understand the thought processes of the individual ball players. He could really delve into their thoughts and see whether or not they had the heart and the soul to participate in a real good conference. His personality was big. On campus, everybody loved him. Everybody wanted a little piece of big house. They wanted to stop and talk to him. He kind of floated around the campus. By the mid-1950s, Big House had accrued a decade of winning seasons, and his stature on campus matched his nickname. The Rams' success was built on Gaines' vision of recruiting skilled black players from the Northeast. He knew the area was a talent hotbed from his time in New York. And in 1957, Gaines brought in the first of a trilogy of program-changing players. Newark, New Jersey native and future NBA top 10 pick, Cleo Hill. He would go out and watch playground basketball. I think that might be one of the ways that he first got uh, Cleo Hill and then became aware of his talent and many other players as well. The best ball was being played in the Northeast. You had to be able to travel to places like New Jersey, Philadelphia, New York, in ways where you could go to the high schools and watch the ball players play. Philadelphia and Ted Blunt followed Hill to Winston-Salem. Their success set the stage for the player who would put the program over the top, Earl Monroe. By the early 1960s, Clarence Gaines and the Rams had arrived. The team had claimed four CIAA conference titles, and Gaines was a two-time conference coach of the year. News that hadn't yet reached a feisty high school kid from South Philly, Earl Monroe. I had never heard of Big House Gaines, didn't know what he looked like, never heard of Winston Salem, didn't know exactly where it was. Monroe was a late bloomer. He didn't focus on basketball until turning 14. And as he would throughout his life, he carried the persona of the city he grew up in. It seems like I've always played with a kind of chip on my shoulder because when I first started playing, everybody would used to laugh at me and things like that. My mother would say, listen, Earl, write down all these people who are dogging you out. And as you get better than them, start crossing those names out. I started doing that, and I felt as though I was getting better and better as, as I start crossing names out. And that was my motivation. In 1962, Monroe led the city in scoring his senior year of high school. Yet, he only received two scholarship offers and rejected them both. Instead, he attended prep school and worked in a factory to make money. All the while, refining his game on the local courts. That's where a Gaines recruiter spotted him and his buddy Steve Smith and offered them both an opportunity to play for Big House down south. The only thing that I really knew about the south was what we saw on TV. You know, the fire hose, the dogs and things of that nature, you know, the out and out, you know, craziness of what was going on. Yeah, I had a lot of re reservations about going, but if I do, if I could bring my man with me, which was a guy named Spinney. When Earl made his decision to attend Winston-Salem, he said, well, I'll go if my man can come with me. That's how I ended up down there. Earl and I had ridden a train from Philadelphia to D.C. Then we had to change trains in D.C. to Winston-Salem. Well, when we got to D.C., we had to move to the colored part of the train. I had been south several times. Uh, my parents were from Georgia, and I knew that you had to, quote unquote, stay in your place. My parents came down to visit me one time and we went out to a diner. You know, we sat down first and then they said, came over and said, you know, we don't serve your kind. I had never been confronted that way about being served or anything like that. And I went off. I mean, my stepfather carried me out of there, you know, kicking and whatnot. Having grown up in the North, there was prejudice, but it wasn't over, you know? When you looked in the kitchen and the people who were cooking looked like you, and then someone comes up and tell you, 
that they don't serve colors. Mind blowing. It was the realization that, you know, yeah, I'm really here and, I'm, and this is what's really happening. You know, the things that I saw on TV, you know, yeah, they're real. And uh, now I have to deal with it. On the court, Monroe ran into another obstacle, the big house way. Freshmen, even those who flashed brilliance, rode the pine. He really did not get that kind of an opportunity unless it was a really close game. And Coach Gaines knew that the only way he was going to win unless he put Earl in. And Coach inserted Earl. Next thing you know, we're back on top, and we eventually won the game. Uh, and then Earl didn't play for another long period of time. I went to him after the season. I said, listen, Coach, I only play when you were down. I come in, I shoot, and we get up, and you take me out, and I don't play. And I think I'm going to transfer somewhere. So the coach said, come back here in about 10 minutes. So the, I came back in 10 minutes, and I said, well, what's up? He says, well, somebody's on the phone here. I go to pick it up, and I say, hello? I say, hello, Ma? <laughs> so he had called my mother. My mother told me to stay in school. Coach Gaines is a great man and don't think about moving. And so that's why I stayed in school four years. At the insistence of his mother, Earl Monroe had reversed course and stayed at Winston-Salem State. By his junior year, he was averaging nearly 30 points per game. His trademark swagger and dazzling style was now the talk of the town and beyond. He started having success because, one, he wasn't a freshman anymore, and he'd learned more about the game at his skill level, and then he began to understand how to learn from Big House. You couldn't stop him. In his mind, he was better than you in his mind. His confidence was out of the building. We just give up the ball and just watch him go ahead and do his thing. And I know at one time, Coach told me, son, yeah, I had to play ball. You know, I had to watch Earl. <laughs> I guarded Earl a lot in practice. I thought I had to spin move down with him. I said, well, he's getting ready to spin. But when he spin one way, he spin back the other way. <laughs> Earl's spin move was like listening to Miles Davis. You never knew what he was going to do. And on top of that, he didn't know what he was going to do. Growing up in eastern North Carolina in the 60s, I think everyone at my high school, at my junior high, wanted to do that spin move. So we, we, we copied him. Well, I always felt that people wanted to see what I was going to do in a particular night. I mean, we played at Norfolk State. And they had 5,000 people outside that couldn't get in the place. His anticipation allowed him to see something developing, I guess, before it happened. You know, there are certain players in basketball that are able to play the game without the ball. The ball is in their possession, but the ball is not important to them. Wherever they want to go and whatever they want to do, they can do it as if the ball is invisible. And Earl had that skill. Gaines was asked about his philosophy. He said, look, get a ball of Earl and get the hell out of the way. That's my offense. <laughs> there was something magical about Earl. I don't know. I mean, it wasn't a light over his head. It could have been. They called him Black Jesus for a while. Half the time we might say that he might be walking on water. So they call him Black Jesus. Then they call him the Pearl. Earl the Pearl. One of basketball's most famous monikers was the brainchild of a sports writer. In tribute to Monroe, he called his column chronicling each game, Earl's Pearl. All of a sudden, because of the number of points that he was scoring, Winston-Salem started to get a lot of press. And then all of a sudden, everybody started to talk about Earl, the Pearl Monroe. The Pearl was no longer a hidden gem. His skill and charisma was attracting widespread attention, and his team grew with him. Big House built the team to compete for more than the conference title. It was just fun playing with those guys. We were brothers. We were in the same fellowship. We weren't just teammates, we were family. 
The Rams finished Monroe's junior season with a record of 21 and five and the CIAA championship. That was good, but the players knew they were capable of more. We didn't accomplish what we could have even our junior year. We was close, but not close enough. So we talked about it before we left and we said, we're gonna come back and be in better shape. And when we had our practices in the gym, I mean, we practiced hard. Our motto was kill, kill, kill. Kill, kill, kill. Kill, kill, kill. We would be in the huddle. We put our hands in the huddle. We say our little prayer. And after our prayer, we would just holler, kill, kill, kill. I'm not so sure if the fans, even myself, had envisioned possibly a national championship. But now I tell you, one who, who knew all the time and believed that could do it, and that was Gaines. He knew what he had, and he knew he had the right kind of chemistry with these guys to do it. No one outpieces the hut. In the 60s, as was the pattern during the time, was when they put highways into cities, those highways usually took the direction of splitting the black community away from the white community. We called it Crossing 52. Highway 52 was the separation of the West, which was white, from the East, which was black. She, you know, dared to cross 52. On the other side of 52 from Winston-Salem State was the predominantly white campus of Wake Forest. Five miles in a world of difference separated the two schools. However, in the late 1950s, the Wake players would travel across 52 to secretly scrimmage against Winston-Salem State, an act that was illegal under Jim Crow laws. Billy Packer was a guard on those Wake Forest teams. Billy Packer, nobody covers him. He shoots and ties the guard. And by the mid-1960s, had become an assistant coach at Wake. He reached out to the Rams to revive that tradition. We had an outstanding player by the name of Paul Long. And, uh, and they had, at this time, a guy named Earl Monroe. So I thought it was a good idea for Paul to play against Earl. You know, back in those days, it was kind of illegal for us to play against the white schools or whatnot. So those games were starting maybe around 12 o'clock at night. A lot of guys you know, on our team had not played against white guys before. So this gave them the experience of playing against those guys. I mean, I loved it. I loved going over there. And it was an experience to go over there and play against those guys. Nobody played like Pearl. Nobody played like him. Don't get mad at me, Pearl. He couldn't outrun you, he couldn't outjump you, he couldn't outmuscle you, he couldn't outquick you, he could just outplay you. Fainting and faking, shimmying and shaking, spinning, shot and making, skill wrapped in deception. That was the Pearl. We played basically run and gun. We learned how to slow the game up by playing against them, and they learned how to speed the game up playing against us. You know, so both teams benefited from that summer workout. The games would be tough. They usually lost. I don't recall them winning any of them. It was a different mindset in terms of you know, what they thought about the game and where they thought their game was and, and where we thought our game was it really was immeasurable. While there was a tremendous respect between the players, when Wake Forest returned the invitation and brought the Rams across town, the reaction was swift. We went over there a lot, and so we got together and we said, hey, why don't you guys come over to Wake Forest and play? We, you know, we had a gym there that we used, nice gym, nice facility. Next thing I know, we was invited to go to Wake Forest and play over there. And all that big floor, I said, this got to be something else. A professor came in the gymnasium and asked me what I thought I was doing. And I said, well, we're just playing a game. And, well, these aren't Wake Forest students. And I said, no, these are people from Winston-Salem State. I want them out of here right now. We're not going to have, and I won't use the word that they use, we're not gonna have those people on our campus. And uh, I told him to get the hell out of the gym. 
And the next day I was called to the president's office at Wake Forest and wanted to know why I said what I did. And I said, because I thought he was out of line. Made me mad, made me ashamed, and embarrassed me. They never came back to our campus. It was the South, and that's the way it had been, and people had trouble changing. So no, I never, I never gave anything like that a second thought. Winston-Salem was a great city, and yeah, you know, it had its, you know, problems, you know, around, but at the same time, you know, Coach Gaines was such an uh, integral um, figure in the community. I saw him as a uniter, a uh, person who saw what was bad and tried to do the work from within to make it better. Preferring to take a different approach in the face of injustice, Big House decided the best way to ease the sting of racism was from inside the room. His philosophy was, you can't make a difference unless you're in the room. And you can also make a difference outside of the room. But for him, his skill set was being in the room and bartering and negotiating and demonstrating why his point of view had value. I'm a child of the segregated South. Lived in an all-black neighborhood, went to an all-black church. My dad coached and was a teacher at an all-black college. And that's just the way things were. But he never let his race, quote unquote, be a roadblock into him expanding his boundaries. Coach was smart. He understood people very well. When we would see him interacting with white people in town, basically, Coach talked to them just like he talked to anyone else. When it came time to go to the city council meeting to talk about reconciliation, when it came time to go down to the corner to tell people to chill, or when it came time to being able to, to have a conversation with white leaders to say, here are things that we can do to help get over this hurdle. And so he used his influence behind the scenes. And I think that is often not understood and not seen, but it was happening. But he never marched in any demonstration at the time. He believed in doing things within the structure and that you could get a lot of accomplishment. There are a lot of ways to get to a destination. You know, his way was to work within the system. The onboard. Up above the world show. Visit inspiration4.com for your chance to go to space. For nearly a decade, Tiny Whitaker Gym, the home of Division II Winston-Salem State, was the backdrop of some of the best basketball plays in the hoop state of North Carolina. Bursting with screaming fans in every game, Whitaker was the very definition of home court advantage. They would squeeze in 2,000 people in a place that was meant to hold 1,000. The energy was there, the enthusiasm was there, the student body was always with us 100%. Imagine a little bandbox Whitaker gym filled to the rafters with a great team, people standing around the baseline, you can't find the seat, standing room only, and people celebrating. Eight, nine deep, you know, screaming, yelling, fans, you know, it was, they were seeing part of history, too. You know, you win, somebody fall into the crowd, yeah, you, you know, you just kind of stick your leg out or, or try to help them, not help them back to the court. Because that's what you do when you're home, right? Come on. But some of the girls, you know, you've been dating out of here, and some of them be hollering at you. All right, Reed, you score 15 points. We can go out on a date tonight. Oh, man, you be out here hustling. <laughs> the demand to see Monroe's senior season was so high, it quickly became clear that Tiny Whitaker was too small to meet it. But where else could the Rams play? The answer stood across Highway 52, Memorial Coliseum. Its capacity was 10 times that of Whitaker, but would they welcome the black ball players and fans? Whitaker Gym was packed night after night after night after night, and it was hard for even the school people to get into the gym. There were several of us that thought, to include Big House, what if we played in the 
uh, Winston Coliseum. And so I went to the mayor and said, what about, can we work this out so that Winston State can play in the Coliseum? If you will, give your attention to the resolution, and I'll read it for the benefit of the news media if they'd like. Fortunately, was a really good liberal and agreed that this would be a great showcase. Monroe's fame straddled Route 52 as both black and white fans flocked to the Coliseum to witness his magic. If you go back in time and understand the dynamics of the 60s, that was extremely rare and powerful that you're bringing whites and blacks into a public facility to watch an all-black team. I said, well, where are all the black people there? <laughs> because I was just seeing a lot of white people, you know, and I said, they coming to see us play. All the white folks came in, and they were sitting in the best seats. And Coach had to go out and announce that they had to move because that's where the students sat. I said, Coach, you got a lot of damn hard. You going out there and tell people they can't sit somewhere? He said, son, that ain't about no hard. That's about right. He said, these students, our students done paid when they do their tuition. That's in it. That's their seats. It was like an experiment, you know? Nobody actually knew how things were going to turn out. The Rams season tipped off with the loss to High Point, but Winston-Salem State caught a break when the result was overturned due to an ineligible player on the other team. That reversal in fortune would spark the Rams and an unrelenting Monroe to a record-breaking school win streak. Earl on that court, he wanted to win really bad, and I guess his spirit affected the rest of us because we knew how hard he was going to come out there and play, so he didn't have any choice. At a certain point, we didn't believe that we could lose, and all of a sudden, it was Earl the Pearl show. Monroe was averaging more than 40 points per game his senior year. The man with the amazing spin move and equally memorable nickname put the Rams on his back and led the team to an undefeated regular season. A uh, good supporting cast around Earl. We made sure Earl took the ball every time down court. I mean, I shot over 60% that year. So, you know, that's why guys wanted me to continue shooting and all that kind of stuff. If he took 200 shots, we didn't care. Okay, so all we wanted to do was win. You know, we had some <laughs> other good players on the team, you know, besides myself. I mean, Smiley averaged about 18 points a game. We averaged about 15, and we had Johnny Watkins about 10. So, you know, we were really a formidable team. I think the whole city was excited. You know, you'd walk into a store or a place to eat or whatever, and they were like, has anybody heard how the how was Sam State's doing? You know, I think everybody was really excited. People wanted to see us. I mean, we were a show. I think everyone in North Carolina knew about Winston Salem State University basketball. Certainly, they knew about Earl Monroe, and he was a larger-than-life figure. I can remember as a youth, you know, thinking about him, and there would be people coming from Eastern North Carolina to Winston Salem just to see him play. Everybody wanted to go. You got a car? I need a ride to the Coliseum. Black and white, side by side, watching some of the best basketball in the country was the ultimate validation of Gaines' approach to race relations. They packed the Coliseum. I mean, absolutely packed it and proved to the world that that little round ball was the focus of everybody's attention. Nobody cared who sat beside them or who sat behind them or in front of them. It was a beautiful relationship. People come up and talk to you and they said, hey, we'd love to see you guys play. You guys are really play as a team. People went to the Coliseum to see basketball. Now, I'm not saying outside the basketball game, everybody all of a sudden changed and said, oh boy, life is uh, perfect. But at the basketball game, that's how it was. But in Winston-Salem, it had a lot to do with people saying, hey, you know, 
this is the guy's the same as me. He's rooting like heck for his team, so am I. The way they play and the type of sportsmanship that they exemplify, they created an environment of acceptance in the city in which we reside. I do think that that particular team was kind of responsible for the race relations in our area at that time. It laid the groundwork for things that, to come after. You know, everybody knew about Winston-Salem. Everybody wanted to go see Winston-Salem State play. And um, it had to affect, you know, folks in a positive way. Coming off the school's first ever undefeated regular season, the Rams had one goal, defend their conference tournament title and clinch a bid to the NCAA Division II tournament. When we went to somebody's school, it was like we would, ah, we got this. Our egos were all out of the stratosphere. We're now 24-0. We're the number one seed. We got the player of the year. We're going to the CIAA tournament to win it. Winston-Salem defeated Hampton in the first round. Up next were perennial rivals, North Carolina a and In their first two meetings of the season, the Rams had won both games. Third time around, though, the Aggies were ready for them. Oh, uh, we would have to talk about North Carolina a and huh? <laughs> we beat a and twice during the uh, year, and it's always hard to beat somebody the third time. And uh, I saw Earl in a zone or an attitude that I'd never seen before. Emotionally, he was like disconnected. The hell, Earl couldn't do nothing right. He couldn't throw the ball in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Coach Gaines told me about, you know, Earl might have been sick. Earl said he was a little sick under the weather. Um, Big House had some other choice expletives about that game where Earl didn't wasn't really playing his best. It was just like he was either hurt or the, the, he lost something in there, but he wasn't himself. I could see that. He's human. He showed he's finally human. The man had a bad game. And we was un, unable to uh, uh, put the pieces together without his big piece. And uh, we had to say we was kind of lost without him that day. The Aggies held Monroe to just 20 points as he made only seven of his 26 shots and crushed the Rams 105 to 82. With an undefeated season gone, the Rams thought their NCAA title mission was over as well. They came to beat me up that game and they succeeded. We just kind of felt as though we had just lost the season. Coach Gaines came in and, and he said, well, listen, you know, we'll just wait and see where we're going to go from here. Usually it was the, the champion of the league that gets the NCAA bid. Um, but because they lost, they thought they weren't going to make the tournament, but they did make the tournament because their regular season record was so good. Um, so when they made the tournament, they had to get the team together to say, okay, hey, we got, we, we're going to play. We're still playing. We're still playing. Stung by the loss of their CIAA tournament title, the Rams refocused on their season goal, the NCAA Division II Championship. In the first round, they cruised by Baldwin-Wallace, 91-76. In the second round came a stern test, Akron and their star, Bob Something Smith. Monroe had scored 53 points against the Zips in their 92-84 regular season victory, but this time, the game was on Akron's court, where the Zips had won 52 straight. We went to Akron. Now, I had never witnessed this in my life. They had 5,000 people at our warm-up, and they had a sign up there I've never forgotten. Earl Monroe is just a myth. He can't compare to something Smith. They had this boy. He thought he was so good. He was blowing kisses to our schoolmates, and that really agitated us. Earl responded to the challenge with 49 points as the Rams silenced the hostile Akron crowd, winning 88 to 80. I never knew something Smith's first name. <laughs> 
Ain't nothing like being in a nice big room bed. We flying in a plane and we're not riding in no station wagon. We're not interested in going back. So we want to stay here. I said, well, we got to go out here and fight. And fight, they did. The Rams reached the championship game in Evansville, Indiana, by soundly beating Long Island and Kentucky Wesleyan in the next two rounds. Awaiting them in the title showdown was Southwest Missouri. At 23 and 4, the Bears stood as a formidable obstacle to the Rams making history. Now, when we left to go out there, we went with a purpose. And we knew uh, our chances were great. We had one of the greatest ball players in the country. And we started realizing that we had something special here going on. Coach Clarence Gaines was one game away from leading an HBCU to an NCAA national championship. The telegrams plastered to his hotel room wall showed that his city believed in him and his team. Win or lose, Big House had become a symbol of hope. You grow up black in America and you're on that stage and you're doing those type of things. You realize it means a lot. He just doesn't have what's to say the state supporting him. He's got the whole CIAA family supporting him. And I'm sure he's got the whole black community in the state of North Carolina supporting him. That Gaines was a kind of a raw, raw kind of guy pregame speech. Everybody was quiet. He said, opportunity does at each and every door knock but it has yet been known to pick a lock and walked out what the heck is he talking about but you know after a while we got to understand that you know that opportunity every door doth knock but it's never been known to pick a lock you've got to be able to go yourself and be able to decipher and whatnot and how to get in that door hi everybody this is a championship game of the ncaa college division basketball finals from Robert Stadium in Evansville, Indiana. We weren't supposed to win because that was the thing that the papers had written. You know, we just said, well, we ain't worrying about it because we got the best guy in the world. And with that knowledge, the Rams took the court for the biggest game of their lives. At guard number 10, Earl Monroe, and got this, a 6'4 senior from Philadelphia, averaging 42.2 a game. More than 6,000 fans were on hand to witness history. Winston-Salem controls the tip, driving in to lay it in. Johnny Watkins for the first two points of the ball game. He was just in the moment. The crowd, nothing. It was just focused on playing and playing the game. Nice move. Look out. Monroe, 31-26. They had heard about Earl, but they hadn't seen Earl. Monroe, we're going to need an adding machine up here, Jody. If the Rams were nervous, they didn't show it early on. Monroe led Winston-Salem State with 19 points to put his team up 37 to 34 at the half. I've seen some of the game on film, and um, you know, the, you know, the commentators or the film, and I saw one of them. The commentators had to leave <laughs> during the game. Well, Jody, with 16-16 remaining in the game, I have to make my exit to head for Indianapolis. <laughs> you know, I remember that on, on the film. English with the rebound. I don't want to leave, Jody. As Monroe sets it up, I'll say goodbye, and uh, it's all yours, Jody. See if you can bring the Bears home a winner. The Bears, though, were not going away. And midway through the second half, they took the lead. Where's Jeffers? And he's fouled on the play. He had called time out of there. He wanted to know, son, you tired? Well, this ain't the time to be tired. He said, you work hard, boy. This is it. This is it. If you want it, this is yours. If you want it. Some of the guys were getting a little nervous, a little unsure of themselves. And the coach needed to uh, inject some of the fatherly coaching that he did in his own special way. And once that was done, it brought our level of aggression back. 
Monroe with it driving. She has it, and he's fouled on the play. With just under three minutes left, the Rams proved they really wanted it. They grabbed the lead and refused to let it go. Boy, I'll tell you. Monroe with 36, 71 to 70. Monroe, I've never seen anything like this. He is something else. Three-point lead, watch him. Witnessing Earl the Pearl hammer that ball. He says, I don't want to score any ball. He says, I just want to dribble this out. The Rams from Winston-Salem College win it. I remember Sam Jones doing that against the 76ers. You throw the ball up in the air, so by the time it comes down, the game's over. There you see the final scoreboard, 77 to 74. Earl to Pearl finished with 40 points. And when the buzzer sounded, Winston-Salem State had become the first HBCU to win an NCAA national title at any level in any sport. In our lives, we hadn't reached any kind of pinnacle of that nature. And it was like, man, what in the world has just happened? We had no idea that we were the first HBCU to win a national championship. We didn't have no idea about that. All we knew is that we had won, and we were enthusiastic about that. Earl Monroe untying the net from the goal. I never really got too up or down in, in terms of wins and losses and whatnot, but this was obviously an accomplishment. You know, I looked at Coach Gaines and I felt a special connection, so to speak with him right at that moment. He put in the effort, the time, and the work to build that program, to build a team, to get those players, to get that connection, and they finally got it right. The triumph of Winston-Salem State resonated on both sides of Highway 52 as the city gathered to welcome the team home. We got back and I was coming off that plane and see the number of people out there, black and white. They were just cheering us on. By now, Winston-Salem State was part of Winston-Salem. So it wasn't the black community welcomes Winston-Salem State back. The whole community welcomed it back. It meant the world to Winston-Salem just because for four years, they knew what Earl the Pearl could do and they watched it firsthand. And to see him on a national stage and win the national championship like that. I mean, wake for
happen is it's the same thing. Uh, to me, it's about an opportunity. I think if you give anybody an opportunity to do something, they can get it done. We see so many black quarterbacks now. When and how did you see it change? I think in the last three years, you can really see the change. You know, I got 